What's up, storytellers? When most people ask the question, how do I tell a good story or how should you tell a good story? They immediately go to technique. And I do that myself. On, on this YouTube channel, I talk a lot about technique. Um, but I think that there are deeper things to consider when we talk about storytelling. And so today, that's what we're going to get into. Beyond technique, what are some of the deeper aspects of why human beings resonate with story in the first place. We all care deeply about telling great stories. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's gonna be really good because um, I have a great guest. But if you don't know who I am, I am Jay Shear, uh, author of the time travel novel, Time Slingers. It's an Amazon, it has been an Amazon top seller. So that's been a really cool experience to, to have that happen. But I'm really excited about my guest. He's been on this channel before. It's always a good time to talk to him. Caleb Monroe is a comic book writer, screenwriter, one of the deepest thinkers about storytelling that I know personally, which is awesome. Um, and he's also on the Reclamation Society's Storytelling Brain Trust, uh, which is basically in charge of all of the stories that we're going to be releasing in the future. Um, he's he's uh, he's part of that as well. So let me welcome Caleb Monroe to the stream. What's up, Caleb? Hi. Glad How are to be you, here. Sir? I'm doing well. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have you on the show because every time I talk to you, I feel like I am... In, want to engage in storytelling even more. I want to engage in it very deeply. You have a lot of very deep things to say about storytelling. I just really appreciate that. Uh, it makes me really excited. So why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Oh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I live in Los Angeles, uh, as Jay mentioned, uh, comic book writer, screenwriter. Um, I, I also do prose fiction. And uh, on top of all of that, I work at a church where I oversee artist communities for writers, among other types of artists. Mm -hmm. so, so you're constantly thinking with other people about what storytelling means and what writing means and how these things impact society. All the time. So I'm super <laughs> excited whenever someone like you will give me an hour to just like to download because yeah. most people don't really want to hear your your six months worth of thought on this like one aspect of story you know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well and we're going to jump all over the place because uh, i think that there's this fascinating aspect of storytelling that i said this in my intro but you know we always talk about technique we always go straight to technique a lot of the videos that you see out there are all about technique and sure there are some really cool ted talks you can find about like things beyond technique about why we're responding to these things i've got a bunch of books on my desk over here i don't think you can see them all but they're all about like why human beings sometimes or or why we're responding so well to stories and why stories are so important to us but it's not a conversation that we have a lot and i was wanting to have that because as i get into technique sometimes i'm just like yeah technique is fine but what i find really energizing about storytelling is the power it has to impact other people the power it has to impact society and culture and really be uh, deeply formative for people. And I'm like, well, that's really engaging to me. So I'm glad that you're joining me on, on the uh, on the video because this will be fun. Um, I have a, a lot of deep questions here and, and I'm gonna, we're gonna jump right into it. So this is gonna, it's gonna start off intense and we're not gonna, we're gonna put our foot to the gas pedal the entire time. Great, let's the go. Conversation. Um, the objective of this show and the whole series that we're going to be doing together is pretty grandiose because we're going to be talking about the philosophical, psychological, and even spiritual implications of storytelling. If you're in the chat, please ask a questions along, give your feedback if you want. Um, and from time to time, I'll address the chat and go through the chat and make sure that you guys are a part of this conversation. But I think that the natural question, the natural first question is in our pursuit of how to tell a good story, what is a good story? Like, how do we define what a good story is? But that feels too big, broad, too, too, too much to take over at one time. So if we're looking a little bit deeper, I think a better question for us to start out with is what elements are present in a good story? Again, we're avoiding technique. So, but what, what elements are present in a good story? Um, what are the foundations that have to be built before we put technique on top of those foundations? So what do you think? What are the elements of a good story? Um, well, uh, first I will say, I consider myself an explorer in this topic, mm. not an expert. Uh, I think you would probably say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. so, it, everything I say, it's a, it, the point is to further the conversation. So, uh, don't uh, don't accept things I say, but uh, interact with and challenge mm, them. Absolutely. Um, and but I will tell you what my thoughts are on an answer to that. 
uh, uh, so humans are wired for story. Hmm. We, and it's not just stories outside of ourselves that we can, f- that we consume. Um, studies have shown that we actually spend four hours a day um, daydreaming. That's a thousand daydreams of about 14 seconds average. Whoa. And so four hours of our day, we are telling ourselves stories, a thousand hmm. stories. Um, and they're small. Um, but when we are asleep dreaming, um, we're also telling ourselves stories in our dreams. And um, what's interesting is that these daydreams and these dreams all follow a pretty universal story structure. It's someone trying to overcome a, a problem, like mm. someone tr- someone with an issue and they are trying to solve it. And so at the end, the reason that we're built this way uh, uh, I should also say it's in it. We're incentivized to do it because when we're focused on a story, our brain releases dopamine, mm. um, which actually makes us more interested and makes us more focused. And the reason that we seem to be uh, constructed this way is that stories are the most effective way that we have of transferring life-saving information mm. um, or or life-changing information. Uh, our, our brains receive about 11 million pieces of information a second. But in that second, they can actually only focus on five or six. Mm. And stories are, and, and so, and the less, the more we try to focus on, the less dopamine uh, we have in our brain. So the more mm. focused we are, the more dopamine gets released. And so stories ultimately are this lens that helps us know what to focus on in any given situation. And they are simulator, they're simulated learning. Mm. Um, so, you know, studies have shown that our brains, when they're dreaming are actually learning and creating new pathways. Mm. Uh, and then when we're daydreaming, usually what we're doing is rehearsing something that we're about to do so Mm. we can do it better. Um, and, and so this sort of looking for patterns helps us because our brains receive more information than we can process. Uh, but it also helps us focus on, on the ones that, uh, that will help us in the future. Mm. So the more stories that we consume, the better we, the more rehearsed we are um, for facing all sorts of problems. Uh, the, you know, um, was it Sully, the pilot who made the, the miraculous landing yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the Hudson River? Well, you know, there, there was a lot of attention given to just like how extraordinary that event was and how miraculous it was, which is all true. But it was also the result of the fact that he had been doing it and rehearsing it in small ways and simulators and in actual flights for mm. decades. Mm. So that when it came time to do it, he just did it. He wasn't consciously thinking, here's what I need to do the plane. Here's what I need to do the plane. Right. He, it, it had been ingrained in him through years of simulation and years mm. of practice. And that's what stories are for us. They're, they're just constant simulation and constant practice so that when things happen, um, we, we just sort of will know what to do, even if it's mm. something we've never encountered before. And, um, oh, I was going somewhere interesting there. That's okay. It'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, uh, is, go for it. Uh, f- fiction readers yeah. have been shown to have better social skills um, oh. because they are constantly rehearsing the solving of problems. Um, mm. So they're sh- they have better empathy and they, have, um, and they are better at settling conflict because they have rehearsed over and over and over again, being empathetic with different characters and settling and watching those characters settle conflicts. Wow. Uh, Cause our brains have these things called mirror neurons, hmm. which means that we, we simulate in ourselves what we're watching or experiencing a character do. And our brain actually can't tell the difference between it actually happening to us and it being, so even when we know it's fiction, our brain still learns it as if we are doing it. Oh, um, awesome. through these mirror neurons. So I, uh, the short answer is that what makes a story is someone trying to solve a problem and, and it's a lifetime of millions of these experiencing of someone trying to solve a problem, whether we're telling that to ourselves or, or getting it from someone else um, that simulate for us how to handle situations. And the more of it we do, the better we are at, at, at facing conflict and, and having empathy and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's really good. Yeah, and I and uh, I have I have a couple of examples here that I want to run by you because I feel like they're examples of sort of what you're talking about. I, I address the problem in a slightly different way because I, I said 
or the question in a slightly different way because when I was thinking about this, I was thinking like, well, why, like, why are we even telling each other stories? Why are we telling ourselves stories like you're talking about? And it's this, and you're right, it is to solve this conflict. And I almost think that that conflict is because we as humans, we want to, and we, what you're actually, as it was you talked, I realized that we're trying to do actually two different things. Because as you say, we're trying to solve problems and, and work our way through conflict, which I think is absolutely true. I think we're also trying to answer the question of what is truth? And I say that like it, it is a capital T truth. Like we're telling each other stories to figure out what is true about the world? What can we believe about the world? What should we believe about the world? The interesting thing about the way that you put it is that once we have some semblance of what truth might be, or if we reject the, the very nature of truth, we can actually tell ourselves lies. That, that Then we say like, actually, I want to win in this scenario. <laughs> even if it's even if I'm doing the wrong things, I want to solve this conflict. And when I solve this conflict, I'd like to, to win in this conflict. Um, so I think that you're right that like, even though I think that stories are there because what we're trying to do as humans is analyze whether or not what's true, we can also subvert that analysis to go straight into, it doesn't really matter what's true or what's not true. In this situation, I want to win. It's almost more of a survival of the fittest as opposed to an altruistic nature between, behind what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah. I, I, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, you know, it's, it, it, it's kind of, when you say truth, I think another interesting way to think about, to, to approach that concept is we're looking for the meta pattern. Yeah. Um, as, as one researcher put it, our, our brains are allergic to randomness and yes. uh, yes. addicted to meaning. And that is because when these 11 million things a second hit our brain, that randomness is overwhelming. Meaning gives us, lets us know which ones to focus on, which enables us to, to navigate life in the first place. So we're allergic to randomness. We're addicted to meaning. And so because of this, we're pattern finding creatures. We're always looking yeah. for a pattern. And that's what stories are. Stories are patterns. They're, yeah. they're constant patterns that we are that we are sort of ingesting and trying on and testing out. But there is there's a dark side to our pattern finding. <laughs> right. um, and that is that um, that comes that's memories and conspiracy theories. So mm. conspiracy theories are what our brain malfunctions because it, there's too much information, but we want there to be a clear pattern and explanation. So we create conspiracy theories um, mm. and, and they affect, it doesn't matter what level of intelligence you are, what level of education you are, they affect us all the same because we're meaning finding, pattern finding creatures. And when we encounter something that we don't know enough about or that we just can't comprehend, we will still find a pattern in it, yes. um, whether it's there or not. And then the other side of that is ourselves because our memories work that same way. We actually don't accurately remember ourselves, our lives yes. or anything that we've seen. Um, and uh, we tell ourselves the story of what we've been through. And we tend to focus on things that make us the hero of our own stories. We, when we will, it's been shown that we minimize the places where we were not the hero and we maximize the places where we are the hero. And uh, for instance, 90% of drivers think that they're above average. And <laughs> 94% right. of university professors think they're above average. Statistically, right. it's not possible, but basically everyone thinks that they're the hero, they're at the top, that they're, they're a little bit better and more special than everyone else. And, and the only people who seem to have accurate self-assessment skills are those who are depressed. Oh, um, interesting. So seeing ourselves as the hero actually seems to be important for our, yeah. our, our sort of mental and emotional health and our ability to navigate the world. Mm. Um, but it, we just have to understand it's a fiction. Yeah. Um, and, and so because of that, we can also cast ourselves as the hero in our minds in situations where we are absolutely not the hero. Um, right. So there is a dark side to that. It seems to be able to, it seems to be important for us to navigate life and be healthy, but there is a dark side to it. I have two examples to to go exactly at what you're what you're actually saying right now. So because I, I was I was thinking about this, and I was like, okay, so what are some of the building blocks of as we're looking for truth or as we're looking to tell ourselves the lies that still give us meaning and put us in a hero seat, even though we don't deserve to be there? Um, there are there are like five basic elements to that, right? We need to know what's happening. So what? 
We need to know where, where is this happening? We need to know when, when, when is this occurring in, in history or, or even during the day? Um, we need to know who, who is experiencing this. And maybe the most important, I think who and why are the two most important. Why is this happening? You said this, the brain is allergic to randomness. Like we have to know why these things are happening. Because if we don't know why, then we can't get, we can't convince ourselves of the meaning that you're talking about, or my word is the, is the truth of what's going on. Right. Um, and so I got, I've got two examples for you. I'll start with this one. Mm -hmm. that I just, just made up. Okay. <laughs> so if I tell you that a man in downtown Los Angeles, where you're at, actually, I'm in Orange County, you're in Los Angeles, a man in downtown Los Angeles ran across the street at 8.05 AM and was hit by a Subaru Outback. Right. That just gives you what, where, and when. That's all it gives you. Uh, and the facts do not allow you. you if, if I just told you that, you would try to fill in the blanks. Our brains would try to fill in the blanks of like, why would a guy just run across the street at 8.05 in the morning? But if I then say go on to include the man, Alexander Drummond, lost his wife and child in a car accident a year earlier. He was devastated by that. He lost his job. He became addicted to heroin. He was living on the street. And that morning... As he was looking to buy more heroin, when he looked across the street to see a toddler pull away from his mother, he ran out onto the street to try and save the toddler, prevent the lady from experiencing the same kind of pain and loss that he had experienced, and he ran out into the street and got hit by a car. All of a sudden, there's meaning for you, right? Like, like I've added the elements of who Alexander Drummond is. I, I can associate with him or not associate with him. I can put him in different categories if I choose to, but also his why is apparent. Because he was hurt by something, hurt very deeply by that thing, and now must overcome that thing if, it, if it's going to happen again. So to your point, I think if we don't know, like a lot of, a lot of uh, journalism starts this way. And this is not me criticizing journalism. Mm -hmm. But it, a lot of journalism starts with just the what, when, and where. And that's great. We need those facts. But what they don't do is we tend to then start to put our own narratives on top of, well, why would that happen? But, but why would that occur? Um, and we start to answer those questions ourselves to find meaning. Um, and I think that that can be actually, you know, it can be fairly dangerous, actually. But I think in the, in the, at the end of the day, we're trying to understand who we are and not only uh, why we're here, but why anything around us actually, actually happens. So a good story in my mind has to have those five elements. But the last two, the who and the why, are critically important in my mind. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think... Uh, so I'll, I'll start by quoting someone smarter and more experienced than me, Algis Budras, um, famous science fiction writer. Um, he talked about how what you need for a story is a character in a setting with a problem. Mm. So that, that's a who, it's a where, and it's um, a what, I guess. Yeah. And that is really, that's all you need to, to start any story. Um, the other things uh, can come, but you know, what's, what's interesting is You know, because mystery, mystery is one of the most engaging story. It's the best-selling genre of all fiction. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Romance is. Mystery yeah. is second. Uh, but both of them, romance itself hinges on a mystery because we know how the we know how the story will end. These two people will get together. The mm. mystery is how are they going to get there and overcome the problems between mm. here and there. Mm. And, I, you know, that is what engages us so much in the stories and gives us that dopamine is we are we are trying to race the storyteller <laughs> in reaching a conclusion about why yeah. uh, because if we reach why before them that means that we have learned this thing you know right. we're stimulating these things so that we can learn them and be better at them in life and our goal is to be better at life in this than our characters right. than the character we're consuming so we we are racing the the storyteller to try to find out what why is ahead of time. Mm. Um, and, mm. you know, and then there are ways that there are ways to turn that on its ear and to take that proclivity of ours and pull mm. us into a story in a wrong direction and surprise us um, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But I think, yeah, I think all five of those things need to be there, but not always in every story. Mm. Um, although it is extremely hard to have a story without a character in a setting with a problem. Yeah. But still, there are people who have done it. Um, I, I recently came across an example. Someone wrote a story where the story itself was the uh -huh. character. 
It was oh. it, it was the protagonist. It, it, very meta, but anyway, you can <laughs> right, <laughs> you can right, get right. A, you can get away with other stuff if 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 you're very good at what you do. But I agree, all those five things need to be there. Some of them don't need to be there till the end, yes. um, especially the why, because uh, if you tell people why at the beginning, then they're not they lose interest. Um, yeah. Uh, although, or, although I've got, or I've got how, another, I should say. Yeah, and I've got another example about about where I think why plays a role because I think you're right. You, the whole story is answering the why. That's the mm -hmm. quest for meaning throughout the entire story. That's a hundred percent. But uh, you've seen John Wick, yeah? Yes. The first John Wick. So, do you think that John Wick as a movie works in any way, shape, or form if the if the villains don't kill the dog? I I do. Okay. So um, how how does it work? But that in um it, because really it's not so much that they killed the dog, it's that they violated the memory of his wife. Correct. And there were there were ways to do that to him that didn't involve the oh, dog. Oh, sure, at all. sure. Yeah, sure, so sure, sure. Now Fair. if you, if the if the question is it just can that be a movie without violating the memory of his wife? Um it can be, but it will be far less satisfying. Exactly. Um, exactly what I was getting at. Because I was thinking about this question. And I was thinking to myself, like, if you don't, if we don't know the character of John Wick, we have to root for him for some reason. And we have to root against the other people for some reason. And mm -hmm. if 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 you remove if you remove who he is, and if you remove why he has a motivation for what he's about to do, and of course we're gonna ask our question our question of like, well, will he will he accomplish it and how will he accomplish it and fill in our fill in our blanks there. But if we don't give him a reason why to do it, it's just a nice two-hour action sequence. It doesn't mean it's not a story, but it's not as compelling to us. We're not going to be as involved in it because it doesn't have as much meaning as, wow, these people are willing to uh, to completely destroy this guy's life based on what his memories were. And, and it's all wrapped up in this little innocent puppy, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it makes for a very compelling... It makes for a very compelling... If you give... If you give everybody a reason to do what they're going to do in the stories you get in you and you make them really uh, well-rounded characters who have meaning and purpose, or maybe they don't, but they have, they learn meaning and purpose along the way to your point. Um, right. Then, then it's interesting and our brains are more engaged, but if it's sure you can get a dopamine effect just by seeing cool action sequences and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think that that doesn't get into the power of storytelling. We could write an entire screenplay. Uh, you and I could write an entire screenplay with really great technique, but if we didn't infuse it with meaning and it was, no, there was nothing meaningful between you and I infused in that. And we were not on a quest to figure out what truth was to me. That's like, why even, why even tell that story? You know what I mean? It just doesn't make as much sense to me personally. No, I, I agree with you. And I just, because we're talking about John Wick, I just have to point out that John Wick has one of the most deft storytelling moments in the mm. past decade in film, um, if not longer. Um, and, and that is this, this moment when the Russian mobster calls John Leguizamo's character and is furious because John Leguizamo had punched his son. Yeah. And, and <laughs> right. he's just, he's like threatening death and, and like, he's just furious and he's not someone you want to piss off. And then when there's a break in the conversation and John Leguizamo says, um, they, um, broke into John Wick's house, stole his car and shot his dog. And the mobster stops being mad immediately. <laughs> right. And he starts being mad at his son. And right. that tells you that that moment, those two men saying that one line about John Wick tells you everything you need to know about him, mm. that he, that he is the monster. Mm. And we haven't really seen that in his character up to this right. point, but right. this Russian mobster is, is shut up by hearing <laughs> that his dog got shot. And turns his anger on his own son, who a minute ago he was defending to the point of like murder and violence and threat. That just so, in a single sentence, no. you're like, "Oh, John is the monster." And then you then you understand what movie you're watching and who he is, <laughs> and the whole rest of it is playing that out. You know, yeah, and uh, just a brilliant a moment of storytelling. Even. That is yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's a really really good point. Um, uh, so let's go to the next question then. Um, as we desire meaning and we're looking for meaning in these stories, um, and you know, somebody listening could argue that, Hey, look, there are stories without meaning and I like stories without meaning and I like action sequences and that's fine. But 
for me, I, I like stories with meaning. Um, and, and, and human beings, like you said, are constantly daydreaming. We're dreaming. We're going through scenarios. We're running through scenarios, not only so that we can solve problems, but also that we can find some semblance of meaning in our lives. Um, so when it comes to the business of writing and targeting an audience with our writing, I, I'm wondering how you answer the question, how do we as storytellers meet the needs and wants of our audience? And as we're going deeper into this, why do human beings even have these needs and wants? Like, what are the needs and wants of our audience? But why do we even have them? Um, and 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 is that question relevant to storytellers? Um, yes, I would say that the question is relevant to storytellers. The answer is not. Mm. Um, if if that makes any sense, it's important for us to know that people are we are, we are beings of desire. Uh, mm -hmm. and we we are are creatures of want and need, um, and just to know that that's who your audience is. When you're mm -hmm. talking to beings of desire, that means you have to tell them stories of desire. Um, mm -hmm. uh, whether that and and there's so many different types of desire, good and bad, that you can tell them a story about. And what's interesting is even when you tell a story that quote unquote has no meaning, the <laughs> what you're doing is you're helping people rehearse for situations they encounter in life that have no meaning. Mm -hmm. So even, even there you are dealing with creatures of desire, um, you know, in a way that's not palatable to most of them, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but can still, can still be useful on, on a subconscious level. So, I mean, I think that we need to, I think the big desires is, are, the people, the reason people want story, meaningful stories is because they want to know, that their story has meaning. Mm. This is why I think that we are that we are wired to make ourselves the hero of our own stories. Yeah. Because we're we're not just created with desires, we are created with desire to understand. Uh, this is why we're padding pattern finding creatures. We want meaning for ourselves. We want to know what does it mean to be human? Uh, why am I human? Um, what does it mean for me to be a human mm. and to be in this world? And that so that's the ultimate desire. Then beneath that, there's so many, all, all other desires are the mountain that lead up to that peak. So any mm. human, any human desire, I think is probably in, in a small fractal way, just an expression of, of that desire to have meaning. Mm. Um, and so I, I think it's important to know that when you tell a story. Now, what I don't think is important is to know what need or want of your audiences you are addressing um, as you tell your story. Um, because if you write a story that resonates with you, that means because it's addressing some need or want you have within yourself, and mm -hmm. but you may not even know what that is, and that is okay. You don't mm -hmm. have to set out to say, I want to give an answer to this desire, or I want to play on this desire of my audience. You just have to know that your, your, your audience are creatures of desire, and so are you, and so just let yourself be a creature of desire mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're telling a story, and it will, it will connect with them, often in ways that you don't understand and ways that they don't understand. Mm, that's really good. Yeah, there, there is uh, to, to kind of to back up what you just said from two storytellers that I really appreciate. Um, Scott Derrickson uh, was on Twitter. Just, this is just a tweet. I just saw a tweet. I don't know Scott Derrickson personally, so this is just a tweet that I saw. Uh, but he was talking about um, the the job of the writer, if you will, is to explore a topic and find all of the, uh, his point was to find all of the relevant ways of addressing that particular topic of exploring it, as opposed to, in other words, you're going into the topic to explore it, to come up with the, with the very nature of truth that the, that the topic is about, as opposed to as a writer starting with, this is the truth I am going to tell. And his point in, in saying that was if you go in with this is the truth I'm going to tell, then a lot of times you will leave out all of the other nuances that are so important to actually expressing that truth in a really healthy way where more people could see themselves in the story. If you just go in to say, this is my truth and is only my truth and this is the way that it is, then you may leave out other perspectives on that truth. And so his point was go explore the truth, mm -hmm. um, which I really liked. The, the other, uh, Ryan Johnson also said, that he doesn't like to write a story until something has angered him 
and that he's seen himself not only being the one that's angered, but the one who was causing the hurt that he's angry at. And then he's like, then I can write the story. And I felt like those two perspectives were really important based on what you just said, because it's a, it's that way. It's not, it's about what desires do I have and how would I explore this concept of desire and how would I explore this, this whole situation to find meaning. And we don't just give somebody propaganda, which I would define as basically my perspective on a topic with no other nuance or no other perspectives that are even ever explored because I want you to believe what I believe. And therefore I'm giving, she's going to shove this in your face. And I think that that's, I thought, I thought that those pieces of advice from Ryan Johnson and Scott Derrickson were really well stated in terms of the storyteller's purpose in exploration of a topic. But yeah, I agree. I think, um, especially Derrickson's quote resonates with me, the explore versus tell a truth, mm -hmm. because I think a mistake that we often make as writers is acting as if we are some different species than the audience. <laughs> right. You know, we're like, what can I do to satisfy my audience? Well, what would satisfy you? You know, yeah. um, you know, I just recently I heard a writer editor say, you've your right, your writing, ex your reading experience far outstrips your writing experience. So trust uh -huh. the reader in you, not the writer in you when, when you're um, trying to determine whether a story works or not. Yeah. Um, because that's the person, that's the version of you that's so much more experienced with stories. Um, yeah. And uh, so I think that when we tell, when we set out with a very clear thing that we want to say and sort of n not, no intention to explore it, but just to say it, what we've done is we've robbed ourselves of the opportunity to find patterns in it mm. and, and to find our own desires in it as we're telling it, which means we're not going to be interested. Our dopamine levels are going to drop because, <laughs> um, because there, you know, so the, the technique that Scott's talking about of, of sort of exploring something from all the angles, eventually you will, you and your story will reach a conclusion about what is probably the best path. Yep. But for you as a writer, you want to give yourself an opportunity to find, you want to look at all of it so you can find the pattern in it that, um, that is a sort of a unique expression of, of how you're interacting with that truth and express that. And when we, when we don't give ourselves the room to explore our truth, yeah. well, we're robbing ourselves. As, as meaning finding creatures, we're robbing ourselves of the opportunity to find meaning. And so that actually goes against our wiring. And then that's why we get stuck on page 60 and we hate ourselves and we hate the work and we just want to go work at a gas station. You know? Yeah, totally. Totally. That's really good. Um, one of the answers I had to this question of like, why do people even have needs and wants um, is you, you called it that we all have within us desire. Right. And, and, and I think like, the next question is, well, why do we have desire? Like why? So if needs and wants exist, why do needs and wants exist? If we have desires, why do desires exist? And at the end of the day, I think that the plain answer, and there's been plenty of stories that have told us this Jurassic Park tells us this, the fly tells us this Watchmen tells us this. You can literally look at all the <laughs> stories that, that, that tell us this, but in this, in, in this is a, I think this is a deeply spiritual point that other people may disagree with me on this, but we are not gods. In other words, if we were gods, we could have whatever we wanted, right? Like we could just uh, even 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 snap it into being. Um, we could we could become uh, Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet and just be like, I want this, and then boom, there it is for us. But inherently, because we are not gods, we do not have those abilities. We have all of these. We need shelter. We need food. We want peace. We have emotional desires. We have physical desires. You go look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. All of those things are, are present. And many of those things are stories that we write because we're taking one of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then we create an entire movie about the fact that we don't get our needs met in this one specific area. Um, and so I think that uh, there's that storytelling is this really interesting um, process of saying, well, we're not gods. So therefore... Uh, pain and suffering and scarcity do exist. They, they exist even, even places that should have an abundance of things and should not experience scarcity. Despite that fact, there's still scarcity for people uh, 
in the world. And so, so our stories are trying to figure out, well, why does that happen? And how can we overcome these things? And many stories, I think this is part of the hero's journey. And, and, and this is, so forgive me for being very, uh, possibly too, too uh, not nuanced enough in terms of me <laughs> talking about the hero's journey. But I almost feel like the hero's journey is the quest we would put ourselves on, knowing that we live in a world with conflicts, knowing that we live in a world that is not perfect and that it does not have abundance and that we have all of these needs. The hero's journey is almost like saying, well, how could we do our best to become as close to God as we could possibly be? And so you have uh, you have stories like Jurassic Park, which are more of a tragedy of like or, or Watchmen, I think, is one of my favorite stories because it, it's so good at saying, look at the depravity of man. The only way mankind can solve the deepest of its problems is if we manufacture bigger problems. Right. Like there's no altruistic uh, nature for us overcoming these things. And so in my mind, if we put ourselves in that place and say, that scarcity is real. Human beings beings have needs and wants because we're not God. And we're trying to attempt to explore the truth of the world. That, to me, is a really interesting place to be in as a storyteller, personally speaking. So Yeah, and I think that has some pretty, um, pretty big practical implications. Mm. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, at the top of the video, I work at a church. So obviously, I have a spiritual lens on everything that I'm talking about. But, you know, I try to talk about something as universal as story right. um, in as universal a way as possible. Um, and I think there's a great little bridge between what you're talking about and just sort of a way to frame story for all of us to think about why are we creatures of desire? Um, uh, there's, there's only two axiomatic statements in the mm. entire New Testament about God. Um, and an axiomatic statement is basically, basically the sentence version of an equal sign. Yeah. So there's two there's two statements that essentially say God equals this. Okay, you know? perfect, perfect. And one of them is God equals life. I mean, no, God equals love and God equals light. Mm. Um, and a, another way that these two things are often talked about, which is why I jumped ahead there, is yeah. as as life. Um, uh, that uh, light and darkness are equated with life and death throughout scripture when they say, mm -hmm. so when they say God is light, they're also making a statement about life and death and source of living and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, but then taking, taking it outside of scripture and, and getting back into our lives, we all know someone probably who stopped desiring and died. Mm -hmm. They didn't want anything else anymore and they died. Mm. You know, studies have shown that people who want to get out of the hospital because there's something they want to do um, live, people who don't <laughs> die. So right. not having desire, literally our bodies just quit because mm. uh, desire is the engine of life. Mm. <laughs> uh, the, 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 to do something, to move on. Um, uh, you, know, I, you know, when, when a person in a couple, uh, you know, someone's been, they've been married for 60 years and one of them yeah. dies, you know, a month later, the other person often dies because all they really want is to be with that person they've been with for 60 years. Mm. It's a desire that can't be met. And so they give up. Yeah. Um, and so you know, on a very simple level, desire is the, is the engine of life. When you mm. stop wanting you stop living like mm. physically you will stop living if there's mm. not, if there's nothing else that you want from life. Um, and so I, I, and you know, I think it's a mystery why these two, those two things are connected, Yeah. but I think that we all have ample evidence to understand that desire is sort of what keeps us moving through life. And in yeah. some way, in some ways is what keeps us alive, which is why we're creatures of desire. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of mystery. <laughs> there's a lot of mystery standing right behind that statement. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there, yeah, and there's so much depth that we can go into, and and we we will go through this whole podcast and probably not even address all of the different issues that we could address with how deep these topics mm -hmm. are. This is why I, this is why I'm so passionate about storytelling because it. I think it gets storytelling is there's a lot of products, right? Like a glass. There's this glass. I have a very fancy. Uh, stemless wine glass to hold my water and this glass is very practical because i need water and water would go through my hands if i didn't have a glass so it's a very practical solution to the problem that i have uh, of of wanting to drink some water um so that's great and I, that's very valuable but stories i think break through the practical 
and they go to, well, what would my life be like if I didn't have a glass? And I, and what would my life be like if I didn't have access to water? Right? Like what, what would my life be like if I, if I did not have the ability to have water come out of a faucet? You know what I mean? Like these, these are the questions that, because I am not God, I can't just will it into being. And therefore I struggle. And that struggle is based on the desire I have because I need a desire. I have a desire for water. And so these are the fascinating things that if you break them down and you keep asking the question, why, 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 you get to a pretty deep place pretty fast. And it's really surprising. And I think that's where the best storytelling, in my opinion, the best storytelling sort of occurs. Um, so in my, so let me ask you this question then. This is a, this is building off the last question about, uh, the fact that people have desire and mm -hmm. what people's needs and wants are, what needs and wants do you think storytelling attempts to address? You've already talked about this a little bit, but what are some of the things that storytelling is attempting to address in this? Uh, I mean, I think that that's, that's, uh, that's an infinity within an infinity um, in, in, in that, you know, it's, it's not the largest of all fields of infinity, but it's still a pretty sizable one as far as what needs or desires and wants are we trying to address? Hmm. Because I, I think the simple answer is um, stories. We tell stories to um, lead better lives. We consume stories to lead better. That's why we tell ourselves four hours worth of stories a day. And while we yeah. tell ourselves stories all through the night, because it, we learn from it and it improves our life. We, uh, we lead better lives. Mm. Um, and because we desire things out of our lives, mm. out of our lives, which is what keeps us alive. We desire things from our life. And so the, the better we are at finding a good path to, and through that, um, yeah. you know, the, the better we are at living. And so, I, the simple answer, I think, is we tell stories to lead better lives. Um, yeah. But that incorporates so many <laughs> things. Right. Um, and, and even the ways we define better incorporates. So, and, and in fact, the way we define better, it has a lot to do with the culture that we were raised in. Mm. Um, you know, there are some universal things that most cultures seem to agree on, but there's a lot of the definition of a good life. Uh, from culture to culture is vastly different. Mm. Um, so, you know, part of it is um, navigating our cultural version of a good life. And then, and part of it is navigating this sort of uh, meta version of a good life where almost every culture agrees on certain, certain values. Right. Um, although the application of those, they don't agree on. Uh, so I'd say a better life, but all the ways to have a better life. I mean, think of the million things that you did just in the past week. Um, right. And or that I did. And I have barely left this room. Um, <laughs> right. But the, but I've done so many things this week and every one of them. I want to just as a as a desiring, meaning finding creature who wants to, you know, have a good life. Every single one of those I would have I would love to have more rehearsal on so that yeah. each one of those things I can do better. So you can tell a story about s some of the simplest things mm. like, like finding water. Um, but you can also, you can tell stories about more complex things and, but we all deal with simple and complex things throughout the day and we all want mm. to rehearse them and we all want to be better at them. Mm. We want, uh, so, so it's an infinity within an infinity. There is sort of this answer saying, well, this infinity is staked out by this, by the fence that is we want to live better lives but within that there's there is an untold number there's we will never exhaust the stories there are to tell um yeah. we haven't so far and we haven't even scratched the surface you know as long as humans exist they'll be telling stories and so it it that's just so it's such a big field so um and 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 that, this is where i think it really is important for you as a writer to follow the things that that are just that that your heart leads you to. Mm. Um, now, I don't want to say follow follow your passions or follow your bliss because that has scientifically been shown to be uh, really bad advice. Um, mm. Mm. Because it it doesn't take into effect the number one factor of stories, which is trouble. That yeah. all stories, even the ones we tell ourselves subconsciously four hours a day, all stories are about encountering a problem. 
Yeah. And so if your life philosophy is about sidestepping problems and just going towards <laughs> bliss, or then then you're actually getting worse at living. And and there's also there's all sorts of scientific proof to back up what I'm saying, mm. but I think it probably makes sense just hearing me say it. So you know, you know there's a whole there's a whole series on Netflix that proves what you're saying. Oh yeah. <laughs> have you seen Hollywood? Uh, I have not. My wife watched it. I have not seen it. Okay, so you have to ask your wife about this. But essentially, after episode three, wherein there are massive problems and there's lots of conflict, episode four on, it's like all the conflict vanishes and it's just bliss. Dude, like really, like the reality is it just becomes bliss. It's like it's like the the last or whatever it is, five or six episodes. The last five or six episodes are essentially all resolution. <laughs> it's like, whoa, this is very <laughs> uncharacteristic of the first three episodes were filled with conflict. And I can't wait to watch the next thing. And then the, the rest of it did feel like bliss. It was like, oh, interesting. This is this is a very fascinating way to do show. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go yeah, a lo along those lines, remind me in a second to come back to the Adams family. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but so when I say follow the things that make you passionate, I, I guess I say follow the things that make you curious. Is probably mm. a better way to phrase that because the exact problems that you are going to be interested in in getting better at solving are going to be unique from person to person. Mm. So don't try to tell something that you think will be interesting to another person. Tell, yeah. you know, follow that thing that's super interesting to you. And then other people who are interested in that will also want to rehearse that. And, um, and the, you know, the bigger that curiosity is in your life, the more likely it is to to hit some sort of universal curiosity. Mm -hmm. And then the more likely that that story is to have a larger audience. But either way, you can't tell a story with audience size in mind. I don't think yeah. not a good one. So follow your curiosity, not your bliss, not your passions. Follow your curiosity um, uh, because there's an infinite number of stories you can tell, an infinite number of problems you can rehearse. So rehearse the ones that interest you, because as we were saying earlier, interest is actually re releases dopamine in your brain. And the, the more interested you are, the more interested you get. Mm. And, um, mm. uh, and the more focused you are, the more focused you get, your brain will actually speed that process up. And so mm. it enables you to tell better stories and stories that will grab people by their mirror neurons and pull them in, <laughs> in in stronger ways because you have used this your own sort of biological reinforcement to tell stories that because mm. it interests you, your brain makes it more interesting because it focuses you, your brain focuses it even further. Um, mm. So you just get more depth of story out of that. Yeah, I love it. Love it. So tell me about the Adams Family. Oh, okay. So I just, <laughs> I, I rewatched the first Adams Family uh, movie last night. I'm in a very goth phase, so I'm in, I'm halfway through the craft right now. Nice. Um, and uh, Adam's family, and after this, I'll probably move on to some neo goth that I really like, like Jennifer's Body and uh, Vampire Academy and Heather's. Nice. But <laughs> I was actually thinking today about why do I like goth stuff so much, <laughs> and, and I actually reached a conclusion. I'm going to pull it up here, but I'm going to talk about Adam's family first because these are separate thoughts. Um, I think that. We will we misread that information um, about their um, about their needing to be a problem in a story, mm. and we will uh, do too much with it. Uh -huh. um, and so, I th and I think a great example of this is um, marriages. Oh, yeah. So in Hollywood and in comics, wherever wherever you are, there are people who you will regularly be told that a, a healthy marriage is boring ah. um, in your story uh, mm. because they want that to be a conflict. Mm. Um, to which I just point everyone to Adam's family and Adam's family values where, <laughs> yeah. where Morticia and Gomez are more into each other mm. than any two humans who have ever lived. And they, <laughs> they are never, there's no conflict between them at all. They are mm. just utterly, deeply, um, romantically, sexually, um, torturously into each other. Mm. Um, but there's still plenty of conflict mm. in, in those movies. So I think we have to, we have to understand that there being needing to be trouble and conflict in a story doesn't mean there needs to be trouble and conflict everywhere in the story. Mm. Um, uh, and, and I've just, I think the Adams family is, movies are just practically a very good example of that. Uh, yeah. Um, and you know, it's part of why I, I, um, 
I don't read Spider-Man comics anymore because when they uh, removed when they removed his marriage, it just felt like an amateur move to me. It's like, oh, you can't come up with conflict without him being single. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, all right. I guess we're going back to the Bush leagues. Um, right. <laughs> and I just like I'm just I'm just not interested anymore because mm. um, as I grew up, Spider Spider-Man and his marriage to Mary Jane and the ups and downs and the trials and the travails of that actually taught me a lot of things, and mm. I valued marriage more having read Spider-Man comics than I did not because when I'm, mm. you know, I'm 12 and I'm reading about them having a fight because she has to do a, a nude scene in a movie or whatever. Yeah. And that's not a situation I had encountered, but it enabled me to rehearse all sorts of situations that uh. as an adult now um, in Hollywood, <laughs> I have encountered, yeah. um, you know, and so anyway, that's, that's a tangent. That's let's, we won't fall down that hole, but all, all I was going to say is we, we have to, we get to choose where the conflict is mm. And it doesn't have to be everywhere. Mm. Um, and then side thought, the reason that I think I'm, I'm, I'm really feeling goth movies right now is because what I, what I love about them is that they, they encourage you, one, to feel things all the way. And um, they encourage you that the dark and the frightening can be beautiful and beloved. Mm. Um, so, you know, because people, people often get hung up on the darkness involved. Mm. Um, mm. But the, we all encounter so much darkness constantly yeah. in yeah. life. Um, turn on the news for two minutes. That's all it takes. Yeah. Scientifically, that's all it takes to um, make your mood worse. Two minutes of news. Two um, minutes of news. That's it. That's it. It will actually, it will literally ruin your day because you encounter, these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, you encounter so much condensed darkness. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, stories that actually give us a framework for what it means to live in darkness and still find beauty, uh, I think, are very relevant right now. And I, I, yeah. I think that's subconsciously why I've, I've started going back and watching all of these goth movies from the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Well, you and I have talked about horror before, and it's the same yes. thing, right? Like, it's the same, mm -hmm. it's the same type of deal. Um, just a real quick answer for me, because building upon what you said, because I think that that's all really, really accurate and true is that if if we're looking for uh, why human beings have needs and why storytellers matter in terms of trying to address these concerns that people have, these desires that people have, these wants and needs people have, if we're not gods, then it begs deeper questions because it begs, why are we here if we're not gods? Who are we if we're not gods? If, if we were gods, we could be whoever we wanted to be. But if you're not a god, then how do you know who you are and who you're supposed to be? It's a it's an internal process of working it out. Um, why do things happen? If you if you're if you're a god, you know why everything happens. You go, oh, I see all the connections. I'm God. But if you're not a god, you have no clue, and you have to figure it out. You have to daydream a thousand times a day, uh, or whatever it is. And so I think that these are the questions that you know. What do we do with our time here? Um, these are the important questions where we can find meaning. And so storytellers have the duty of going in and saying, I'm going to explore this topic because the answer I want to receive gives me some semblance of an answer to a deeper question. And I think too, like a lot of times, if we're storytellers, we can just stop at what do we do with our time here? Um, even one of the reasons why I'm never thrilled about the hero's journey, I know people love the hero's journey, but I'm just never thrilled <laughs> about it, is because ultimately it's kind of like, it only addresses what you do with your time here. It does not address, yeah, sure, there's plenty of conflict in that, but it doesn't address, well, not, not often, but, you know, why are we here? Who are we? I mean, it does say, who are we really? That's fair. I'll give them that. Right. I'll give them the year I was that. But I just, I want these deeper answers to these questions. Uh, uh, oftentimes, a goth story is not a hero's journey story, and I respect that because the goth story acknowledges that there's actually no such thing as a hero, right? Like, like ultimately, you already said this too. Like, we try to convince ourselves we're the really heroes constantly. I feel like we we are. Uh, I feel like our job as humans is to try and convince ourselves that the world is not as bad as it actually is, so that we can actually just convince ourselves to live another day. But if we really were to look at how bad the world actually is, then we really need to ask deeper questions about why this is happening. Uh, like I said, who we are in this process. Uh, I, that's why one of the reasons I brought up Watchmen earlier and Watchmen's about as goth of a comic as you're going to get. Right. Um, in terms of like, it's not goth in the traditional sense of like it, everything is um, 
everything is. It does have uh, a trench coat in it, though. It does have and, a trench coat. And lots coat. of shadows. <laughs> lots of shadows. But the whole the whole thing is basically an exploration of the depravity of man, in my opinion. Um, and I think that that's a real, those are the, some of my favorite stories because they reveal the true nature of, of humanity. And, if, and I think so sometimes when we look at the hero's journey, we can reveal a false nature of humanity. Not that we can't become heroes, not that we shouldn't do good things, not that we shouldn't rise above our circumstances. And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, what if you can't? What if you can't? Then you live in the goth world. And let's let's identify that that's actually a lot more like the real world. Um, so anyways, I, I won't go off on any more tirades about the heroes. No, I'll just, I'll just say that sort of it, that all comes down to um this will be this will be my final thought to leave with people and then you can yeah. um then then you can bring us home but you know we've talked about how desire is the engine of life it mm. literally keeps us alive um and we've talked about we want to live better lives um, right right but i think behind all of that there's a big big question and this is this is the thing that you try to answer with your by defining what a good life is, you're answering this, hmm. but, but, but it is a bigger question than what's the good life. And that is why live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, desire keeps us alive, but, but why, why is a life preferable? Like mm. why, why, why live? Mm. Um, and so if we're going to talk about sort of the things behind technique <laughs> and yeah. the, the big things behind the good things, I, I think that really every story is probably an attempt to answer the question, why live? Oh, that's really good. And, and so what is your, what is your answer to that question? Uh, I mean, my answer is, is going to be broadly theological in scope <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because so, I, but you know, and I, I, I think I'll just say it that way because people will get a sense of it, but you know, essentially I, you know, I believe that uh, humans were made to reflect the image of God mm. as a goodness within creation and, um, to essentially be the glue that holds creation and God together because they're created beings and um, bear the image of a creator being. Right. So mm. that's, but that's a huge thing like, <laughs> about why to live. But, but what I think is important is I, there are a lot of stories that I really love by people who reach it to have a different answer on that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's the question worth asking. Mm. Um, and so I'm, you know, some of my favorite filmmakers and comic book writers um, are they are deeply spiritual, mm. um, a very different spirituality than mine. I, and Absolutely. I would say some of them a rather um, unhealthy spirituality. But because of that, their their work is always asking the big questions. So mm. I'm I'm more drawn to their to their work, whether yeah. I whether the conclusions resonate with me or not. I'm more drawn to their work um, than I am to a lot of other people who are answering smaller questions. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, the size of the question that you as a reader really want to tackle at any given time is, uh, you know, it's also fine to have very small questions and, um, you know, uh, watch, a, you know, iCarly or something. It can, st <laughs> it can still, it can still be enjoyable, you know, but, um, uh, but the stuff that really sticks with me, yeah. For a long time, even if even if I have a completely different answer to the why live question or what makes a good life question is the stuff that bothered to really delve into it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so just to just to capitalize on what you just said in terms of this why live, there is a there is a sense to me. Uh, Alan Moore is the is the writer of the original graphic novel of Watchmen. I keep bringing up Watchmen um, because it occurred to me as we were talking about this. I love Watchmen, and I love Zack Snyder's adaptation of it, too. I love it because of this conclusion that we are not capable of becoming heroes. And so sometimes, why are we not capable of becoming heroes? And I think that that's a worthy question to answer. It's almost like the same question to me, just at a different level, of why are we not capable of becoming gods? Why are we not capable of living into who we know we would like to be? And I think that the answer to that question has to lead you to spiritual answers. You can, you can come up with, no, I mean, you can come up with a lack of spirituality as your answer to that question. You can come up with a, the answer that basically says, look, we are creatures. We're all animals. It's survival of the fittest. And that's just what it is. 
Um, but at the end of the day, to me, that doesn't seem to account for reasons why we would even tell stories. Why would we tell stories if it's survival of the fittest is the thing? I mean, obviously, you can make an excuse for it, right? You can say, oh, well, we want to educate each other on how to survive. Um, but quite frankly, if it's just pure survival of the fittest, maybe I don't want you to survive because the, the world is scarce, a fold of full <laughs> scarcity, and I need the thing, and you have the thing, and I, and I need to take it from you or whatever. So I think that we all inherently have this desire for beauty, this desire for love, this desire for meaning. And all of those things are answered in the fact that if we are depraved and if we are not capable of attaining those things in the true nature of them, we can find some semblances of them. But if we can't find them in their true nature, then we must be reliant upon on, on something else that is God. Uh, and to me, that's where the stories that keep keep sort of going a layer deeper, right? Peeling the onion back another layer uh, become really meaningful to me personally because it allows me to, it allows my brain to go there with people. And, and I actually commiserate with people too because I can watch Watchmen and go, there were some really cool action sequences, but at the end of the day, like, I'm, you know, I'm depraved and you're depraved. Like, this sucks, right? What do we do about this? And we can have a good conversation. I think a good conversation about what that looks like. Um, where can people find more information about you, Caleb? Uh, my website, calebmonroe.com. That is mm -hmm. the simplest thing. Uh, there's also a link on the contact page there if you would like to sign up for my newsletter. Nice. I, uh, I do not send newsletters super often. Yeah, uh, I haven't sent one yet this year, but uh, <laughs> but it is the if you're like really interested in finding out what I'm doing, it is the first place where I usually talk about things. And um, I sort of envy you because you don't have any social media, really, do you? No. Yeah, no. that's I envy that because that is a uh, talk about uh, bad news every two minutes. <laughs> well, that was it was in, it was intentional. It was very intentional on my part because I was I was watching social media and news chain like just degrade the quality of my life. This was three, four years ago. Yeah. And I, I noticed what, what I noticed here's, here was the breaking point, but I noticed yeah. that after two minutes on Facebook, I started to reach the conclusion that everyone I knew was an idiot. <laughs> um, and, and the thing yeah. is, is, I know all of them. I love all of them. So no, I know they're not idiots, yeah. but two minutes on Facebook convinces you that they are right um because it's only the basest most idiotic things that that come that that rise up to the surface so until you log into twitter <laughs> yeah, yeah then it's even worse and, well, and, that, and i had already at that point i was had stopped using twitter years earlier um yeah so i want to be clear to say that i'm this is not a prescription it is a yeah. description it is a description of what worked for me when we go yeah, back yeah, to the yeah. idea of of what is a good life and why right. live. Right. Uh, to me, social media and the news cycle don't really factor into what is a good life and, <laughs> right, and why right. live, to be honest. Right. Uh, I think there's a difference between something going on in the world and me knowing about it. And also, I, I, I'll tell you what, I never miss any big events in the world. Never. I don't look at, I, this year, I have not looked at news once. I have not looked at social media once. Wow. But but every time the 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 restrictions change in the city of Los Angeles, every time a new development in coronavirus, um, every time something new comes up in 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 racial conflict or in social unrest or in the political development, I always know what it is. I always know right. what it is within a day because because people talk about it in person. I hear it from people talking about it in person, not right. online. Um, so I would just say that if you feel if you think that leaving social media and the news behind means that you're not going to be informed about what's going on in the world. That it's not true at all. Um, but, <laughs> no. uh, but I, I, that is, that is people are, have that addiction to needing to know what's going on. And it goes back to our pattern finding. We need to know why it's going on. Mm. We need like, the, we feel like if we get enough information, we will see the pattern. We will know why the world is this way. Yeah. And, and so it literally, um, we get addicted to it because it releases dopamine uh, mm -hmm. to 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 keep consuming that story and to have that focus of trying to solve it. Um, yeah. yeah, for, for what stuff. it's worth. <laughs> yeah, that's good I love it. Yeah, I love it. I wish I, wish I didn't have any social media. That'd be the best. Um, well, go sign up to Caleb's newsletter. You may get one this year. You may not. You may have to wait till twenty twenty. I will say. Uh, actually, I'll give everyone a pre newsletter exclusive right here. <laughs> there now. you go. There you go. Uh, I am sending a newsletter next week because the uh, the film that I co wrote, the Mongolian Connection. Oh which, yeah. Which up to this point has only had Asian theatrical release. Um, mm. Is being released on streaming Tuesday. Um, so I will be, I will be seeing a newsletter to let people know 
that I was on this podcast here today yeah. and that the new movie is dropping and uh, those sort of things. So, that sounds amazing. I can't wait yeah. to watch that. That'd be awesome. I'll <laughs> add that to my uh, my quarantine watch list right there. Yes. Well, thanks again for joining me. Go check out Caleb's stuff. Uh, Caleb uh, has done... Caleb's giving me some of the best feedback I've ever received on uh, the short film I'm working on. In fact, I have to... I have to resubmit that short film to you guys because I've completely changed so much of it. Um, but yeah, so if for more conversations just like this, uh, Caleb's going to join me for a couple more of these, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. I want to do a live show basically every other week. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. I also have a storytelling tips series going on. That's all technique, by the way. Um, and if especially for beginner writers, that's a really cool place to, to, to start. Those are coming out every Wednesday. These will be every other Friday for right now. And uh, appreciate you all watching. And hopefully you got some valuable insights into the depth of storytelling that exists beyond just technique into the deeper meaning of what we're discussing. And I appreciate everybody for hanging out with us. So have a great weekend, everybody. And we will talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me.